Thank you, everybody. It's a true mm -hmm. honor to be here. Thanks for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the future might hold for recycling. And I call it the Wild West because right now the way that recycling is done in most countries is centralized and largely ineffective. If we use the U.S. as an example, uh, we recycle less than 10% of our waste. I know the wonderful place I'm staying here in Nancy, we don't recycle there, which is somewhat shocking because we normally, in America, we think of Europe is very far ahead of us in terms of recycling and green technology. Uh, but overall, the entire world doesn't do much better than 10%. So of all the plastic that was ever created, uh, we've only recycled a small percentage of it. This is something that we could largely ignore before uh, because the recycling that did take place happened mostly in China. However, because of environmental concerns, China has now refused to take everybody else's waste. And so they're only accepting really high-grade polymers to do recycling with, all our normal post-consumer plastic is no longer accepted there, which means everybody's going to have to deal with their own waste. And so in the US, what poultry recycling <coughs> did have is now under serious threat. And the reason for that is the economics of recycling plastic have always been very weak. It's a low density, low value material. It's scattered all over the place. It's usually used to package food, so it gets contaminated. And so it's, it's very hard to make it economical. At the same time, the reason, you know, if you ask the average person in Europe or the U.S. if they're, you know, for recycling, everybody's, yes, we love recycling, but then we don't do it. And the main reason for that is that we're not incentivized to recycle. You don't get paid money every time you recycle, you know, an old plastic uh, container. Um, most of the time, it even costs you money in order to be able to recycle it. Uh, we're only using more plastic, and it's expected to be very, very high in the coming future. So there's two solutions to this problem I'd like to talk about. One, uh, the first half of it, is distributed production. Uh, in the not-so-distant past, when you think about production, industrial manufacturing, it has to be centralized. You need economy of scale. And that idea has been turned on upon its head in the last couple of years because of 3D printing, and in, pr in particular, uh, a lawyer here who's a professor at Bath, or was a professor at Bath University in Britain. Uh, he developed the first self-replicating rapid prototyper, which is a 3D printer that can print its own components. And here's the first version, and it's, it's baby right underneath it. And when he was conceiving of this idea, long before he actually had a working prototype, uh, he had this idea that if you ever made a self-replicating rapid prototyper, um, it would quickly begin to evolve like a biological organism. And there'd be pressure in order to improve it, and humans would be the actors on that, that technological evolution. And the things that he predicted uh, largely came true. So this is the beginning of the RepRap family tree, uh, where there, that original design got better and better as it went through each generation of hundreds and now thousands of people actively hacking on the device in order to make it a superior uh, technology. Uh, so here's some examples, and we have many examples next door in the Fab Lab of different types of 3D printers that came specifically from that original open source introduction of the RepRap. Now, here's some more. And you can see that by their architectures, they have all different kinds of basic geometries. They have all different kinds of functions. Some of them can print in different types of plastic and metals uh, and ceramics. Uh, in my own research group, we started fairly early in the kind of the rep rap evolutionary craze. So we started off with one of the very early ones. There's a couple of my students demonstrating it. And I can tell you that very first one broke the first time we printed it. And anyone that's you know, been working next door uh, for a few years knows that those early 3D printers were extremely challenging to work with. Uh, you know, we had to literally hold the corner together as it was printing out a replacement corner in order to get it to work. Uh, but by the second generation, things have started to improve a little bit. So if this took two students a summer to put together and get operational. This took one student a semester to put together and get operational. And all, on those, the blue and white components that you see there are 3D printed themselves. It's using open source electronics. And it's beginning to be improved by people from all over the globe. That improvement began to accelerate. By the time we got to this version, um, our group really started to use them as scientific tools. They weren't play things anymore. It wasn't just a prototype stuff. It was to make devices that we would then use in our own labs. And so this is demonstrating the use of open source CAD on an open source Linux controlled computer, uh, making an open source scientific tool on an open source 3D printer. 
that particular tool is sort of what opened my eyes to, and really, really got interested in it, is that's replacing a $2,500 automated filter wheel for $50 in open source electronics and 3D printed parts. And so for my lab, we've saved, at this point, hundreds of thousands of dollars making our own tools. So it's very easy to convince scientists who are used to playing heavy markups for their research, uh, but it's also possible to take it to the masses. So we're getting pretty good at making these 3D printers, and so we started offering a class in it. And the, the top picture is the very first class. And so the deal with this class is everybody makes an open source 3D printer. Uh, you get to use it for uh, progressively more complicated design experiments throughout the year. And then at the end of the semester, you get to take it home. So this class became exceptionally popular. Uh, Michigan Tech is an engineering school. Almost all of our students are engineers and they couldn't get enough of this. So it was filled every year. And so because of that, this next year, we're going to be offering it online. Uh, you can see where we packed the room. Also, this is the difference between the first time we've offered it and the last time I offered it. And if you look at those printers, you can see they're a little bit different. Uh, they're missing the tops of them, and that's specifically to allow people to hack it easier. And so now, not only can you do conventional plastic printing, you can print up, you can stage print, which means you can print metal or ceramics or pastes or use it to decorate cakes or to PCB mill electronics. Uh, you can use it for laser cutting. It can be used for all different kinds of things. It is an automated open source 3D robot that you have complete control over three-dimensional space. If any of you are interested in that, I open source the course on Wikiversity. Uh, everything about it is free. You can download everything, the, the, the PowerPoint presentations, the videos, the homework assignments, all the code, and all the code to make that device is open itself. So the firmware that we put on it was written by students. All the hacks have been written by students. To pass my course, if you're a graduate student, you must make a material improvement to the printer that that then gets rolled into the next semester's course. And so all these kind of fancy additional applications uh, came from students themselves. And so now we've got it down to being able to build one of these in less than eight hours for an unexperienced new student, uh, and it costs less than $500. Uh, we could do better. One of the first hacks was to solar power it. And so the idea here is that if you have anywhere that you can get a suitcase or a duffel bag, uh, for under $1,000, you can start manufacturing. And that means in the middle of, you know, the, most poor community on the planet, as long as they have sunlight, you can start to manufacture. And we, of course, are not alone in this. There's thousands of people hacking on these machines, including hundreds of companies. Um, these are just some of the examples of commercialized 3D printers that came from the RepRap. Almost every 3D printer on the market at this point has some RepRap technology embedded into it, even if it's something like the Gigabot here, which has very few 3D printed parts that actually make it up. The other thing to note about this is that in the US we have a magazine called Make Magazine. It's for makers, for people that use Fab Labs, hackers, that type of people. And every year they run a 3D printing shootout where all the vendors that sell 3D printers can send their 3D printers in, they print um, sort of the same objects and they're graded. Every year, for the last couple of years, an open source 3D printer has won that competition. It usually switches between Molespot in the US and Prusa here in Europe. That's remarkable, because closed source out of the manufacturing has started back in the 1980s. These are large monster corporations with hundreds of engineers at the helm. They cannot compete with a bunch of random high school, college kids, and small little startup 3D printing firms, and it's because we're all working together. You can't, it doesn't matter how good your company is, even if you've got a thousand engineers on your belt, you don't have tens of thousands of engineers on your belt, and that's what open source has provided the additive manufacturing community. If you a feel for how, like when I say it's better, I'm not, this isn't just like, because I like open source stuff. Uh, this is a, a Prusum Mendel rep wrap. There's one <coughs> in the store, you can take a look at it. And this is the quality of the print that you can get. This is a Stratasys. So Stratasys was the original holder of the FDM type patents. Cost 12,000 euros, and you can literally see the difference in quality. It's noticeably crummier. And in fact, if my students turn in stuff like this for my class, they get downgraded. This is not acceptable anymore with what we can do with open source firmware and slicing. Now why would normal people care about this? Sure, engineering students love it, scientists love it, but why do normal people love it? Normal people like 3D printing, and the reason the vast majority of 3D printers now are this type of 3D printer, they're low cost, just a thousand or a couple thousand euros, um, and they're printing primarily in plastic. People are choosing to buy them because of the things they can make with them. There are millions of open source designs already available on dozens of different repositories on the web. And for all different kinds of things, toys, uh, clothes, jewelry, 
uh, quadcopters, things for your cameras, um, gifts that you might give, musical instruments, tools to help you solder. Um, all different kinds of crazy things are already available. You download them, you print them for free, uh, using only the, the, the cost of the electricity and the materials that you use them for. Uh, you can print impossible things. And so this is a little bit difficult to see, but this is a digital sundial, which would be maybe possible using conventional manufacturing, and you could whittle it out of wood if you had a lot of time, um, but 3D printing this is trivial. So you put in your latitude, your location on the planet, and it immediately spits out a digital sundial that will work in your backyard. Um, so that's fun, but you can also uh, use it for very practical things. If the design of the open source product is done properly, you can make it so other people that know nothing about design can easily customize it for themselves. Uh, so for example, for my children in, in the US, uh, these fidget spinners were very popular for a while. And my daughter actually started a little business at her school where she would 3D print them and sell them to her friends because they were selling on the open market for five to $10 and you could print them for pennies. And you could print all different kinds, all different shapes. And all you, once you got into the code, you would just go into it, change the things to change the colors or the, what it looked like, and then you could you'd have another product. You can also do it for practical things like hinges or hooks that you might want for your house. Uh, you can also do things that you can't afford. Uh, so a lot of my research actually deals with semiconductor research and making these solar cells. And one of the things we wanted was a method to lay down very thin uniform layers of semiconductor material. And one of the best ways to do this is with a slot die system. And you can see from these cutaway uh, slot die designs why they would be very expensive to manufacture conventionally. And you try milling something out that has detailed geom geometries on the inside and very small orifices on the outside. 3D printing this, however, is trivial. And so on this rinky-dink old 3D printer, uh, we turned that into a slot die system just by adding a syringe pump to a normal uh, 3D printer. And this part right here, the slot die, normally costs about $4,000. That's a very expensive thing that you send to a specialty machine shop. We can print it for a quarter. Now you can as well. So anyone that wants slot die systems can now be mass manufacturing them, or at least micro manufacturing them, uh, from relatively low cost open source 3D printers. Now that's impressive, but what gets really impressive and what I think is going to potentially change the way that we deal with manufacturing of plastic and recycling in a minute, yes, we can beat scientific tools and high-end uh, commercial consumer products, but we can also beat the low end. Uh, so in the U.S., and I don't know if there's an equivalent here in France, we have dollar stores. And the idea there is it's the cheapest, junkiest, rinky-dink stuff that's mass manufactured in China, brought over on a boat, and then you get it for literally a dollar. So everything in the store is a dollar. Or it used to be a dollar, now it's like $1.99. Uh, but it's about a dollar. And so let's say you need shower curtain rings for your apartment uh, shower. Uh, the cheapest that you can buy online is, is about 20, or, sorry, is $2.99. If you 3D print them from commercial filament, it's $1.20. And the ones that are shown here in the picture are about $10 on Amazon. If you 3D print it, even using commercial filament, you can always beat the cost of Chinese mass manufactured shower curtain rings. Now that shouldn't be possible because we know filament is marked up considerably and they're pumping out shower curtain rings by the ton and you're just printing out say 12 or 10 for your own shower. And it doesn't stop there. Um, in my house, we, we like the, the show Vikings on the History Channel. I don't know if you get it here, it's pretty fun. Uh, but one of the things that was cool about that show is they started to release designs to encourage you to be happy about the show um, for free. And one of the designs they released uh, were these wristbands that you get when you become a man Viking. And so the curtains in my house are all man Viking rings. It costs nothing more. It can be any color you want, the, the design, is what you want, what you think is cool, and everybody will have a different definition of it, and that's the power of sort of being able to distributely manufacture your own goods. Now, you can also help other people. One of the really popular things to do once you get a 3D printer, besides printing a 3D printer for your best friend, is also to help out uh, little children that are, say, missing fingers. And so this Enabling the Future project is made up completely of volunteers that use their 3D printers to print out prosthetics for uh, children that need them. Um, you can also start to get really creative, and this is the part that excites me about being sort of in this age, is anything you imagine you can really make at this point. And so if you have a really cool idea for a Halloween costume like Bindi did, you can make it. And so this is using open source, this is free CAD, open source software to do the CAD, printed it on an open source printer, 
polished up and painted. And then all the lighting that controlled the thing was with open source electronics, Arduino controlled electronics. And so you can have completely off the hook Halloween costumes um, for almost nothing. And then you can share them with your friends so that they can all dress up too and have a good time at, at parties. Let me give you another example of the economics. So I'm not necessarily an artistic type, I'm an engineer. And so I'm thinking about function. And one of the things that I wanted was a straight razor. It costs 20 to 80 dollars online, and that's why most people use disposable razors, because there's that, that barrier that you have to get over to pay that initial upfront cost for them. Um, and so I had some leftover parts, you can see uh, from the dark wraps, those are good old M3 nuts and bolts. And I printed out some plastic, got some disposable razors from Amazon, and you can see this is when you trust your, your engineering. Half of my face is shaved and the other half is not. It worked. It's not pretty. It was okay. It was functional. This was in January 20th of 2013. By March, somebody had made one that you might actually consider using or printing out for yourself. And by 2017, people are going completely berserk. So you can now get a safety razor kit in any theme that you want, whether it's you know, Pokemon or dinosaurs or Star Wars. And the, wh why someone would do this, besides it's just cool and it's not available on the market, is because of saving. So if you right now have to use Gillette cartridges, you're probably burning through about $300 a year. If you assume that you're shaving for 65 years, just by switching over to disposable blades and 3D printed parts, you're saving 19,000. And I didn't cheat here, there's no interest, you didn't put your money on the stock market, this is just straight out flat savings on one product in your house. And there is no question that if you're into Star Wars, mm -hmm. the 3D printable Star Wars shaving stuff is better than what you can find now on the market. There is nothing um, that I'm aware of. Now, that sounds pretty good. And we did a study that showed that not only did you, you crush economically by manufacturing your own goods, it's also better environmentally. But there are two environmental problems. Uh, first of all is we create a lot of waste. Anyone that's used the 3D printers over here in the Fab Lab, even though they're taken care of excellently and they're at the top of the line, you don't always get what you want. And that usual plastic is then produ uh, producing waste. Uh, the other problem is that filament costs a lot of money. So here's just a screenshot I took the other day of what you can expect to pay for filaments. And so remember, this is per kilogram. And so we're, we're ranging from sort of like 30, maybe down to 20 on the low end. Uh, but you can, this, and this is $75 for only half a kilogram of flexible material. And so if you want something rubbery, you're paying $150 a kilogram, which is ridiculous because on the mass market for plastic, it's like a dollar a kilogram or even less. Which brings us to the second part of the solution, and that's distributed recycling. So because we were one of the first groups that was getting into this and creating a lot of plastic waste in the beginning, it, and I think it kind of dawns on everybody. This is one of those inventions that's invented in multiple places all over the world, even if you don't talk to each other, is that why don't we take the waste that we're creating from our 3D printer, put it back into filament, and turn it back into 3D printed parts. And so this is our very first recycle bot. It is an automated waste plastic extrusion machine that makes filament. It's using a uh, windshield wiper motor driven to a, sh a chain to an auger, which is just a drill bit that we got from the local hardware store through a hot zone and spits out plastic. And even those of you that are into sort of waste recycling won't necessarily recognize that picture because I never published it. And the reason is it exploded in my lab one night when we were running plastic through it because it's made out of a bunch of cheap plywood that we found in the dumpster. So, that was a bad design. Um, we went completely the other direction and went heavily over-engineered. This is all aluminum extruded rails, steel parts. There's no way this is exploding. And we got a little fancy, so we got Arduino controls, so you punch in your type of plastic and it immediately changes the uh, heat and the, the speed that it's spinning, and you can make good, high-quality filament from waste. So then we started to get really excited about this kind of stuff and do lots of different versions. So this is the fourth version, and this particular system was made to be solar powered with the idea that it would be used in the developing world, someplace where you didn't have electricity, to take waste plastic literally in a dump and turn it into high quality filament uh, while you're right there. And so that looked pretty good. Um, it was supported by the Ford Foundation, and lots of other groups started to become interested in it. And that begged the question of, well, does this make sense again? Because it's all well and good if you can do something economically and it works, but if, you, you're just, if this is meant to help the environment and you're actually not helping the environment, you should know about that right away. 
So uh, in terms of embodied energy and embodied emissions, it is better to recycle something yourself if you're replacing a virgin resin, no question. You're dropping it by 89%. If you're comparing it to centralized recycling, it's about the same. In our study, it came out as 3% better, but that's sort of the error in this type of life cycle analysis studies. If you have to travel any distance to get to that recycling center, then it gets extremely interesting. And so if you're in Paris and they already have a recycling center, it's sort of a wash. But if you're in an, any community not associated with a major recycling center, then you're, make, you're saving significant energy, significant emissions, uh, and it's absolutely better for the environment. Now, possibly in some countries, like uh, the German, Germany and the Scandinavian countries, doing the right thing environmentally might get you there. In the United States, it will not get you there. The only way this is going to happen is if the economics work out. And that's where this gets particularly exciting. So let's take the example of we, we do milk jugs, not in liters, but in gallons. So pretty big pieces of plastic. If you take a few of those, about 20, uh, you can get about a kilogram of HTP. And the electricity cost to run it through a recycle bot is on the order of 10 cents. And so now rather than spending, say, $20 per kilogram, I'm spending 10 cents per kilogram. And to give you a feel for what that means for an actual commercial object, it's considered an orange juicer. Uh, the cheapest you can find online is about $7. Most of them cost at least double that. Uh, if you print it from commercial PLA, it's around $2.76. You do it from recycled plastic, it's four cents. And so now, having fresh squeezed orange juice, if you have access to the oranges, is a four cent object that almost everybody can afford. Uh, to give another example, uh, you know, in in the US, Europe is often sort of elevated as a place to take really good care of your kids, valuing education, you know, bringing out the best in young people. And so uh, we thought it was sort of weird that the Swiss, there was like these Swiss building blocks. And I'm like, how are these better than normal square building blocks? And I looked at it, and there was $160 for 16 blocks, which to me is just like, you know, I will do everything I can for my children, but that is pretty ridiculous. And so you look at the shape. I can CAD that in 10 seconds. And so lots of other people, and if you print that in, in waste plastic, it's only 64 cents for this, the whole set. And now, kids can play with it everywhere in the world, just not the super highly educated Swiss kids. Um, if you do a sensitivity analysis on the energy that it takes to go into things, uh, the, the, the gist of it is, the further away you are from the collection center, the more energy that it will take. If you're using off-the-grid electricity, it makes sense in most places after you get out a couple miles. If you use solar electricity, it's basically a wash everywhere. And so we can then put all this together. Uh, so this paper was about taking waste plastic from our IT center. It was um, things that would hold servers together that the, the IT department didn't need anymore, and they were made out of ABS. So we took it, ground it up, ran it through a recycle bot, took that plastic and ran it into a 3D printer, and analyzed the mess out of the whole, the whole of it. And the, the bottom line is that it makes enormous energetic sense to do it that way, cut the energy use in about half, and it makes enormous economic sense. And so if you take just the example of that camera lens hood, it's about $10 online, and you can make one yourself for three cents. And what that means is that every one of your friends, all 333 of them, can also have a camera lens for the same cost as buying one commercial. Also, of course, it can be customized in any color you want, and so forth and so on. Uh, but we haven't stopped there. And so the RecycleBot technology, anyone that's worked on it knows that it is, there's art to it. You are, it's just not throwing the plastic and out comes perfect filament. And, and so we really wanted to get to the point where we had a tool that other people could start to hack on the way the uh, 3D printers have been hacked on. And so we tried to make a rep-wrappable RecycleBot. So if this is a waste plastic extruder where most of the parts, the black, the yellow, and the pink parts are all made out of waste plastic themselves. And it's using a little bit bulkier, better stepper motor, but not as sort of hardcore as the ones that you saw in the vertical systems, uh, using an empty two liter bottle to put in the plastic and making commercial grade filament out the other end. And so we have uh, width sensors so that we're monitoring and controlling the actual diameter of the filament. Uh, you can also make it so you can check the sphericity. And the bottom line for this is for $700, you can make a system that you can use to make more than enough filament for yourself personally. And for something like a Fab Lab, this probably can produce enough filament to keep at least a couple printers in operation. You need more for more printers. Uh, if you use pellets, commercial pellets that you can buy from um, China in bulk, it cuts the cost of your 
filament down by about a factor of five. If you use waste that you are grinding yourself and not charging the labor cost for it, it drops it down to two and a half cents per kilogram. And, and so you'll notice that we're getting more energy efficient uh, with our devices with time. And I think that is only going to continue to get better. And we're not alone in all this. The very first recycle bot, as far as I know, is this one done by Australian students. They had this really cool idea of, well, you know, why don't we make it hand powered so there's no even, you know. And it worked, sort of, in that it made filament like material, but you'd never stick that in a printer. And some other ones started to get closer and closer to it. And um, at this point, there are several research groups throughout the world that are taking this quite seriously. Deakin University has solar-powered 3D printing, solar-powered recycling systems. They go to uh, islands in the Solomon Islands where they got nothing, take the last plastic waste that washes up on the beach and turns it into things that they need there, uh, like piping systems for their drinking water. Uh, and they're luckily, I'm very pleased to announce, there's an explosion of open source recycle bots. All different kinds, some of them are commercialized, uh, at this point, we haven't had any major 3D printing company come out with one yet, but there's many startups that are interested in it, and I know there's some of the big names are sniffing around. This is coming, no question about it. Um, to give you a feel, and to kind of take us back to this Wild West approach of how eminent this is, this is Hugh Lyman, he's retired, and I'm not sure exactly what he did before retirement, but after retirement, his hobbies are building recycle bots, golfing, and fishing. One guy has taken this technology to the point that if you want to build one of these in your house and you have almost no skills, you can pull it off. This system is extremely simplified. It use, is a little bit more expensive and doesn't have quite as high a quality as, say, the system next door, uh, but it's good enough to make filament at least from pellets. But we don't need to stop there. So we've got plastic waste, and we know we could turn every type of plastic waste to the 3D printing filament. All the major types of plastic have been done at this point. Uh, but you can also start to mix things that are either not normally 3D printable or that are other waste products. So in Michigan, uh, one of the things we do is we manufacture a lot of furniture. And, and from actually most of the furniture in the US, most of the wood furniture. And so it's to the point now where the furniture industry is creating 50 tons a day of waste wood. So if you have like a circular table, it was made as a square, you cut off this little triangle circle piece and that gets thrown in the dumpster. Um, it's considered a hazardous waste because of the resins that they use to bind it together. And so we said, mm, I bet we can 3D print that. So we ground it up um, using a, a kind of a standard mill, sifted it, mixed it with plastic, got something that was not overly pretty, granulated it, and pushed out film. And now we are printing recycled wood filament from waste that costs less than the recycled plastic because the wood is a waste product and they will pay us to take it away. If any of you would like to start a business, I have 50 tons a day of wood for you to deal with. Um, the neat thing about printing in wood is it has all the properties of normal wood. So you can sand it, you can stain it, you can paint it. Uh, if you change the temperature as you're printing with it, you can put in, book back in the, the, uh, the lines from the, the trees. Um, this <laughs> is of interest to industry because for the furniture manufacturers, there's some pieces that they still had to buy that were made out of metal or something else and now we can fabricate them for themselves, at the very least doing prototype, but in the very near future, starting to go into actual production with it. Um, because we've been messing around a lot with these waste plastics and trying to make composites with them, we similarly found that going the first run is very challenging. And so we came up with, with this device. It is a uh, pelletizer made out of a normal drill, uh, standard drill bits and 3D printed parts, and a couple stepper motors. The idea here is you're pushing filament into the drill, it gets chopped up into pellets, and you can control how big those pellets are so that you can control some of the ratio of the different plastics that you're putting into your, your polymer. And when we first made this, a lot of the comments on the web were like, why would you take perfectly good filament and chop it up? But if you've made one of these waste plastic composites, you know that the first run through a recycle bot system is not pretty. It's not really ready to be put in a 3D printer. But you use this, and you can turn into like commercial grade plastic pellets which is itself a product that's worth, say, two to five dollars a kilogram, and then you can take that and put it into your um, recycle bot system to make filament. But, so we like memes in the US, I don't know if you've ever seen this one. Um, if the old girlfriend was recycle bot, the additive manufacturing recycling community is really interested in direct waste 3D printing. 
So we teamed up with Re3D, which is a spin-off from NASA that makes open source large scale 3D printers. And they're usually, like their goal is usually furniture and that kind of stuff, they, they can make toys too. Um, but they're, they have big printers. And their customers that are printing out things like this um, are churning through filament, right? And they're paying $20 a kilogram for that stuff. And so, I don't know how much that thing costs, but it was probably like $100. And yeah, it's cool, but is it really worth $100? Probably not. And so their customers are complaining about the cost of filament, and Re3D is looking for a way around it, so they went to a pellet-fed extruder. And so this is a, the Gigabot X, it's an experimental prototype to use pellets to 3D print with. And so we got the first one, and we used to, we worked with them to go through a whole big bunch of different plastics. So at this point, we've done PLA and ABS, which are the two most common 3D printing plastics, as well as PET and polypropylene, which are the two most common waste plastics, six, and they all print. So this thing is truly amazing. It doesn't really matter what you put in it, as long as it can get to the auger, it's going to get printed. So you can use commercial pellets, virgin ones, chopped up ones, shards. We took a bunch of plastic waste, just beat the tar out of it and threw it in, and that still works. And the, the secret to why it works so well is the design, which is also open source. So this Re3D company, this is the real deal. If you want to go and manufacture these or download and mill them out and make them yourself, you absolutely can. Uh, you can buy the parts from them or you can make it yourself. And so they get help from universities like mine, uh, from their customers all the time. And so they're in this sort of rapid evolution of technology. But the secret as far as I understand now is a dual feeding zone. And so you take your waste shards, your pellets, whatever it is, you put it through the first heating zone. They melt. Then it goes into the second heating zone, and if you look at the screw, it's actually a two to one compression. So it's starting to really push the plastic together, pushing out all the air gaps. It goes into the second heating zone, and that's the one you control for the printing. And you get unbelievably good prints. I, I can't stress this enough. We were shocked that this worked at all, let alone well. And so then we started having a lot of fun with it. So we're like, okay, if we can print, and you know, the first thing that my lab always does is print out a bunch of tinsel bars. So we have a box of these things sitting around, and they're not overly exciting. You can't put them on display. Uh, but it would be interesting to really show that these large-scale 3D printers are worth it. Now, the Gigabot is not a, a, a super inexpensive printer. It's inexpensive for an investor printer, but not inexpensive compared to a RepRap. And they were planning, or they're planning to sell the Gigabot X for $18,500. And so that puts it clearly out of the cost range for most consumers and into the cost range of like a fab lab or a, a company that's looking at doing either large scale production or prototyping. And so we chose to look at three human scale objects, a snowshoes because we're in the north, skateboard because the student, the head student on this project uh, was a skater, and uh, kayak paddles. And uh, first of all, it was completely possible to use waste plastic to make commercial versions, or commercial equivalents of all these technologies. So this is Aubrey. Um, after we, so we did the paper when that was just a normal skateboard, and then of course we're not done yet, so he used open source plans to make it an e-skateboard, and if you look carefully at his hand, he's got the remote control for it. So that is a completely electronic skateboard, all open source, everything's 3D printed except the base part of it with the, the wheels and the bearings. Um, this is a busy slide. The, what I want you to get from it is we looked at every case of if you had a Gigabot X, say here at the Fab Lab, and you were trying to make that make financial sense just by itself, printing out only skateboards. And so skateboard decks take about 12 hours to print. So this is not an easy, simple print. This is something where you'd set one up in the morning when you came in, and if you were being especially aggressive, you might put one out uh, before you left for, the, for work from the day at the end of the day. And if you do that and then compare it to the economics of skateboard decks, uh, you're making money no matter what. If you're using this thing in all the cases except for only printing once a week, you're getting a return on your money. And some of those returns start to get pretty silly. So if we look at using it continuously, so you're printing out two skateboard decks a day, uh, you're making 53% rate of return on your money at the lowest cost skateboard deck on the market. And if you compare it to the highest cost one, it's over 2,000. Now remember, this skateboard deck is completely customizable. So you can put your favorite artist on it, your favorite singer, your favorite cartoon character, it doesn't matter what. And so that would probably push it out of the range of the lowest cost, cheapest, simplest skateboard deck into something that is more interesting and more profitable. Uh, same thing with the snowshoes. 
It wasn't quite as dramatic for this because there's a lot of 3D printed components that go into the snowshoe besides just the deck. Uh, but overall, again, a clear and present moneymaker in all but the worst case scenario where you're only printing one pair of snowshoes a week. Uh, the kayak paddle was a little different though. Uh, because of the kayak paddle, you can't buy just the paddle, you need to buy the whole thing. And the whole thing comes with a bar. So we used the cheapest aluminum bar that we could find, and we put it on it. And you can see there's a lot of places here where you're not earning your money back. You basically, it only functions economically if you are directly competing with one of the higher end kayak paddles. And there might be some reason to assume that that's true. And part of that came from just pure luck. So this was an ABS paddle. We treated it with acetone to smooth it out. And when we did that, it became hydrophobic which means that you then don't need a splash guard on your kayak paddle, and so you eliminated a part, and you got potentially a better, higher performance paddle. Could you sell it for more at the higher end? I'm not sure, uh, but the lesson here is that the more parts of a product that you move into this recycling waste stream, the more economically advantageous it is. And so you can't be using commercial aluminum bar that you're buying from the hardware store one at a time, if you were going to do a real business with this, you would buy it in bulk, and that would drop the cost, and then you'd be competitive. Or if you were to do it really smart, you lose the aluminum altogether, and you only use 3D printed parts. Um, the last paper that we did, and this was just accepted this morning, so I'm kind of happy about it, <laughs> is on polycarbonate. And so everything that I talked about so far was sort of the low-end, sort of normal plastic. Polycarbonate is an engineering plastic, has higher strength, higher temperature uh, capabilities. And so we went, we looked at the potential to do that, and it prints out quite nicely. It's a little bit more challenging than all the other materials that we used. And you can partially see some of the things we had to do. So up until this point, we were using like an ABS or a PLA, a PLA hopper, put polycarbonate shards in it. It just tears it to shreds. So we got rid of that, put on an aluminum hopper, and the ones that Re3D is selling are, are all metal. So this will never happen to anyone else again. Uh, but, you know, as the guinea pigs, we, we learn the hard way. Um, and so we did a high temperature application. That's a steamer. That's actually the steamer at my house. And the, the steamer at my house broke. It was made out of plastic. It was not a good plastic. And over a couple months of use, it eventually degraded and the whole thing fell apart. That's ridiculous. It was planned for obsolescence. It was not meant to be a five-year device. But there's nothing really wrong with it. And that head, all it's doing is pushing, it's just uh, providing a conduit for steam to go. It, it's not doing anything fancy. And so making a new one, relatively easy and trivial, and could have absolutely hold up to the temperature. Uh, it's also good for hard things. And so it's literally still snowing at my home university right now. It's very nice to be here amongst the sunlight. Um, and so using these ice scrapers, you might say, well, what's that for? But we use those every day. So, uh, having a stronger plastic component that can stand up to chipping away ice is important, and that was no trouble. And then this is probably the one that is the most interesting, I think, for this crowd and anybody interested in recycling, is some polymers, particularly some waste plastic polymer composites, don't 3D print. It's really, really challenging. You wouldn't want to stick it even in a direct extruder like the Gigabot X because it would tear it to shreds. So say you're doing something that's highly abrasive, you don't want to put that through your metal components and rip it up. Uh, but you might still want to make objects out of it. And maybe you want to make a lot of objects. And so one of the things that you can do with polycarbonate is to make molds that then you can use for lower melting temperature plastics. And so now normal everyday people have the potential to make themselves injection molding machines and do the molder itself using this sort of waste plastic stream. So you can use either the head of your 3D printer or the head of your RecycleBot, or the head of your Gigabot X to extrude plastic into the mold, and it doesn't matter what that is. And so you might, for example, take a very low cost RecycleBot system that you don't care about that much, you're using off-the-shelf pipes and, and uh, augers, throw in whatever kind of ridiculous mess you're thinking about doing, push it into a mold, and now you've got molten, 100% uh, solid plastic object made for basically the minor cost of electricity and uh, the cost of materials. And we really, I can't stress this enough, we're just barely scratching the surface. Like we've got an entire industrial ecosystem that we have to completely replace with one that's distributed. And so uh, you'll notice one of the things that I talk about here because usually when we made the waste plastics, like if you're gonna take empty water bottles and turn them into filament, you need to shred this plastic up. And in the old days we were using 
office shredders, so the cross-cut big office shredders that you put like a DVD through, they work really good. And if you see our original papers, they were awesome. And then we stopped using them. And it was about after two years, because after two years of doing this, they don't work so well anymore. And it is not a good solution. And so we went to commercial shredders. And those are expensive, not going to be available for the public anytime soon. So we began making our own. So this is the second version of our sort of Fab Lab scale uh, open source shredder. And then this is what we're working on now. Uh, if you look at that, it's made out of plastic. So this is polycarbonate. Um, there is no reason this isn't going to work. It's just a little bit more sweat equity. And then we're going to be able to take something that's 3D printable, that's made for a couple dollars. Uh, this is, again, a windshield wiper motor. I'm, I don't know. I like them. They're available everywhere. You can get them from the junkyards. And uh, easy to work with. And we're going to be able to shred plastic, possibly, in the comfort of your own home. Um, we still need a good open source small scale injection molder. And I hear there's a spin off company doing that, possibly uh, right here. I can't wait to meet them. Uh, we need some good open source grinding. These are definitely not ready for showtime yet. Uh, we need a Fab Lab scale shredder. So, starting to think about making open source industrial machines using the same digital replication technology that we're making everything else out of. And I, I can't stress enough that the way this is going to fly is economics. And it might seem trivial, but let's just consider the economics of a Lego brick. If you buy a commercial one, it's six cents. And so this is not a big cost, which is why you know, kids play with Legos. Uh, they don't have, and so this is for the commercialized, patented, trademarked Lego. Or I guess not patented, trademarked Lego. You can get generic Legos, made the same injection molding machines in China for three cents. They're not quite as smooth or perfect, but they definitely build just fine. No question about it. You 3D print it, it's 5.8 cents, and this is 3D printed from commercial plastic. So yes, you beat Lego, but you're not beating China. 3D printed from pellets, now it's 1.4 cents. Now, if you're using the same starting material as China does, they can't compete with you. 3D print it from waste, now you're down to under half a cent. You can smooth it with acetone, now you've got the exact same thing as the commercial product. And if you injection mold it from waste plastic, you're going to destroy the economics. It'll be well under half a cent. And you might say, well, who would do such a thing? Everybody. Teamed up with my mini factory, which is just one of the dozens of open repositories for 3D designs. And they, were, they watched one month of download activity on their site to see what people were choosing. Now, my mini factory is not the most serious. It doesn't have like a lot of scientific tools. It has a lot of toys and games and uh, costumes and that kind of thing. We looked at just the 100 most downloaded items for one month and found $5 million of avoided costs. One company, one month, only 100 things. They have hundreds of thousands of things. There's millions of things out there. How is this possible? It's because now there's tens and probably hundreds of thousands of these small 3D printers running around all over the place. If I look at just Michigan Tech alone, I know that my class has generated several hundred 3D printers. I know that we've done uh, 3D printing workshops for teachers and made several hundred more, and that those teachers usually end up building more at their school, so they might start with two from us, and then they get up to 10. Our university alone, I am confident right now, has hundreds of these 3D printers running around. And it is only going to get more and more and more common. Every time like a new series of students comes in, now many of them have built one of these printers already. They understand them, they're using them at home, they're using them at their businesses, they're using them uh, for the companies that they end up going and working for. And I think it is not hard at all to believe that we are going to enter a future where many of the, the plastic products at least that we make might be manufactured at home. Which brings me to the great debate that we've been having about what does distributed really mean? And so in America, we're very, very individualistic. And so when I think about this problem, I'm immediately thinking about my garage. Can I put a waste plastic shredder and a recycle bot and a 3D printer in my garage and manufacture things for myself in my own home, things that my family wants? Um, in the French context, which is definitely more community oriented, the idea is maybe that's kind of a dumb and wasteful thing because you're not going to be running a recycle bot 24-7 in your house, but you could run a recycle bot 24-7 at a fab lab, absolutely, maybe several of them. And Will we sort of this French method of doing what's best for the community prevail, or will the American method of doing what's best for yourself prevail? And to, to give you a feel for how different our philosophies are, um, in the US you could pretty much do whatever you want as long as you don't kill anybody. 
but sometimes you can even kill people. So we have this stand your ground law, and I don't think there's anything equivalent here in France, where if you threaten me, if I feel threatened, I can shoot you in most of these states. It's only this one, really, where that's not cool. You have to leave. Um, and then some of them, like, it depends, like, if you're in your own house and you feel threatened, then you can shoot them. Some of them, if you're in your own car and you feel threatened, you can shoot them. So you're out on the highway, somebody cuts you off, and that's why we have some issues. Um, we'll see. To give you a, a glimpse of what the future might look like, I want to share something that came from the past when I was in college. So while I was in college, uh, you know, we drink drinks out of aluminum cans, get thrown away. And in the, the local community of State College, they funded the retirement program for the, pe the waste workers, the people that collect trash, by collecting aluminum cans and selling them. And so they were collecting them centrally, they were boxing them up, aluminum is a valuable resource, and they were selling them, and that went into people's retirement funds. And so you better believe every single aluminum can in State College got pulled out of the trash. Because if you're a garbage man and you see aluminum cans in the trash, that's you getting to retire at 65 instead of 70. You're pulling that aluminum can out and throwing it in the recycle bin. It's a very successful recycling program. Aluminum cans get recycled all the time in the US. In order to try to encourage more recycling, a few states, including Michigan, started to put a uh, provide in a financial incentive. So if you took your can to a recycling center in Michigan, you got a dime. And a dime probably doesn't mean much to you here, but a dime back then was ten of them. That's a dollar. You can get another drink. And so that was a pretty big deal. And it was such a big deal that the fraternities at my school started actively collecting aluminum cans, smashing them down, filling up um, trucks with them, driving them to Michigan to get the deposits. And they would make thousands of dollars a trip. So this became really popular, really fast, to the point that people started to go into the recycle bins at the university and pull out the aluminum to take to Michigan and make the money. It got so bad that the university changed the rules. So up until then, we didn't have rules for going into a dumpster and taking trash. But when I left the university, you could get kicked out of the school for stealing aluminum cans from the waste bin. Imagine a potential future where your neighbor is digging around in your uh, waste receptacle to pull out the plastic so that they can, say, 3D print themselves their own deck. That might happen, at least in the US. <laughs> um, so I think I'll stop here. It was, it's been a pleasure to be here, and I'd be happy to, to take any questions.